So for years, the uh, research was very slow going, and it was probably slow going for two reasons, I think. One was that we didn't have the technology to study viruses, and the other thing is that the medical industrial complex that was growing in the 40s and the 50s and the early 60s was really geared toward diagnosis and treatment of disease. And that was understandable. We had new ways of diagnosing disease. We had new ways of treating disease. And we had lots of people who had reason to enter the healthcare system. So the propensity was diagnosis and treatment. Uh, and that actually worked very well, although it tended to be a bit inflationary. And the whole idea of can we prevent disease really didn't come up until we ran out of money. As you know, we've run out of money with regard to healthcare. So work on uh, the mouse memory tumor virus lingered for a while, but it picked up again in the 1970s. <coughs> Excuse me, when scientists decided uh, to use the technology that they had, which was they were able to get fingerprints from the mouse memory tumor virus. And they went into the Department of Pathology and they said, maybe have the slides of women who've had breast cancer. And they used this fingerprint to see how many of those breast specimens showed evidence of the, the virus. And they found it 39% of the time. Now this study was repeated by other researchers in other institutions looking at other sets of breast cancer specimens. So this was very interesting. The other very intriguing thing was that in women who had breast cancer, who had these fingerprints in their breast cancer cells, the benign tissue around that cancer, many of these women had had mastectomy, so there was a lot of benign tissue. That benign tissue did not show evidence of mouse memory tumor virus. Again, very incriminating. Now you know that fingerprints don't make the case, but they make the suspect. So the interest in mouse memory tumor virus as a cause of human breast cancer got sort of kicked up a notch. Next slide. In the 1980s, they started to look for evidence of this virus in the blood of women who had breast cancer. And they found, one research team found it 18% of the time. But when they looked in, into the blood of women who did not have cancer, they found it only about 3% of the time. Interesting, they found evidence of this virus in breast cyst fluid. Now breast cysts are very common. Lots of women have them, they tend to get them in their 40s and 50s. They drive everybody crazy. You know, most of them are benign, but there's a big workup and, and it really generates a lot of anxiety. And when my patients, uh, all 6,000 of them, ask me, you know, why did I get this disease? Why do I have this cyst? So I'm so forth. I can look at them blankly. I really don't know why, why anybody gets cysts. I have some ideas, but I don't know for sure. I just thought it was very interesting that they found evidence of virus in cyst fluid. They also found fingerprints of mouse memory tumor virus in human DNA. <clears throat> Next slide. So where are we now with the new millennium? Um, <clears throat> there are a number of scientists who are doing work on this virus, but mostly they're sort of holed up in separate institutions uh, in a fragmented way, underfunded across the world. But some of them have proposed that actually humans get uh, this virus from mice. Uh, and they have begun to call this the human memory tumor virus, HMTV. Other scientists have said, you know, if we can figure this out, we could perhaps create a vaccine. Sounds like a good idea. I don't know if you saw the news this morning, but you know, uh, scientists have been working for 30 years uh, trying to get a vaccine against HIV, and they made some progress this morning. So, I mean, that's wonderful. Considering HIV is a retrovirus, and remember, it embeds itself into the DNA. So, how are you going to tease it out? Okay, it's in there. Uh, scientists may have found a way to do that, and that may very well inform the work that I hope that we're going to be doing on mass and rich human virus. Um, and importantly, and this may in fact explain some of what we see in terms of statistics, and that is that this virus increases the replication rate in the presence of hormones. 
hormone replacement therapy, birth control pills, all the hormones that are in our water supply. The question is, are these having an interactive effect on a virus? Now those are big questions, they're farther down the road. We haven't proved that this virus causes breast cancer. I think we need to do that because down the road are questions that I think are worth answering, such as what is the interaction between hormones in this virus? What is the interaction between women who have a gene for breast cancer, the BRCA genes, where we know exactly where the mutation is and we know just what the risks are. There's no law written that you can't have two things wrong at the same time. So it would be interesting to study women who are BRCA positive because you know precisely where their mutation is to say, what kind of an interaction might there be between the virus and the BRCA gene? <coughs> Again, a little bit farther down the road, but I can sort of see down there. Okay, so here, here, here it is. Here's the bad boy right here. Um, <coughs> replicating, right? Has entered the cell like a pirate, turned it into a factory, making more of itself right here. And here it is budding out. And there it is looking for the neighbors. Okay, next slide. So. When I first learned about this virus three years ago, I was very surprised. I considered myself to be something of a breast cancer expert, and I had never heard of it. I mean, I was at Memorial Sloan County, nobody had said a word about that. Uh, I listened to the videotapes, I read the textbooks, uh, I went to the conferences, didn't hear a word about the virus. So when I first discovered this, uh, I had been presented several years ago at a breast conference, and I saw the slides. I thought, oh, this must be new, this is, this is very interesting. So I went to my um, medical librarian and I said, would you please do a literature search? Um, let me see what Dr. Holland has written and let's see what anybody else might have written about mouse memory tumor virus. And I've got to tell you, I was shocked to discover that there's 70 years of research on this. And I thought, that's a long time for this to be on the radar. So at that time, I was completing an international master's for health leadership at McGill University. And as I was finishing that master's program, I was thinking, well, now, what shall I do with this health leadership experience that I have? Uh, how can I merge that with my experience as a breast cancer surgeon? And it just came you know, to me in a flash. What I want to do is create a foundation whose mission is to discover the causes of breast cancer. And I would like to first of all answer the question, does a virus cause breast cancer in women? So I created the Pink Virus Project, and this is the question that I'm hoping to answer. Next slide. Um, I have been very, very fortunate uh, in talking the talk and getting a lot of support for this. And so, the first of its kind, first of a series of breast cancer summits, will convene on October the 9th um, in Washington, D.C. Uh, I have invited the researchers who are working on the mouse memory tumor virus to join us and present and summarize their data. They will be presenting this to a large group of stakeholders, uh, research institutions, universities, support groups, interest groups, the media, politicians, and breast cancer survivors. And we're going to have a meeting in the Senate caucus room uh, on Capitol Hill. So, what I would like to do is to ask for your support. If any of you are thinking in your businesses of having uh, an event or a sponsorship for breast cancer uh, in October, um, I would appreciate if you would um, think about um, considering um, helping us uh, in this effort uh, to answer the question, is a virus cause breast cancer? Thank you. Those are, that's just one of the series. 
um, in an attempt to spare women the uh, rather tedious exercise of having unnecessary biopsies. So if we can get a more accurate image of the breast and understand more accurately what might be abnormal within the breast, um, then we can separate the group of women who need a biopsy from those who do not. Uh, and and there's, there's a lot that's being done right now uh, to do that. Here? Oh, everywhere. Radiologists um, have developed an entire discipline just in breast cancer screening, just in mammographic screening, and under that umbrella, screening for breast cancer, are any number of technologies that are being developed